broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cyber Reason webinar, the Year of the Defender 2018 Attack Overview. I'm going to be your host today. My name is Lital Ashadotan, and I'm a Senior Director of Content and Research here at Cyber Reason. And I'm very happy to have with me Ross, Ross DC, Senior Director of Intelligence Services. Hi, Ross. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've been just chatting about the first World Cup uh, soccer game, uh, how the um, Russians crushed the Saudi Arabians. Uh, and we are looking to talk predictions with you right now. The reality is that uh, in cybersecurity, things change very fast. At the beginning of 2018, actually late in December 2017, we put down together some predictions to what are going to be the trends that we'll see this year. And we decided that six months into the year is the right time to go back and see whether we were right. Uh, are those trends valid? Is it something that people should still care about or do we need to change some of the things that uh, are in our outlook? And kind of grade ourselves uh, we, we want to be harsh and see if we are doing good or if we need to change stuff. So this session today, guys, is going to be interactive. We're going to ask you to grade us for the predictions once we're going to talk about them. Um, you can also um, leave questions for us and we'll try to answer all of them while going through our presentation here. Uh, so feel free to chime in, send us questions. We'll try to talk about them. So with that, I want to start by presenting the four predictions that we have for the year and kind of a fifth one that was an aspirational one. When we thought about how 2018 is going to look like, we said that there are going to be four main attack vectors that we're going to see. Supply chain attacks that will increase. The reality is that in 2017, we saw a bunch of supply chain attacks. Probably the, the most known one was um, MEDOC attack, um, the, the Ukraine uh, um, comp tax services uh, software company uh, that had been breached and was the vector for infection with not Petia, one of the biggest attacks that we've seen um, that year. The second trend that we thought will be a major trend was that destructive attack will continue. Again, that was a trend in 2017 that we've seen going on and we'll talk about it in detail in a few minutes when we get to this topic, um, we thought that destructive attack will be a big thing. We'll tell you why. Um, we also saw a trend in the last few years that we thought will continue of the blurring lines between APT nation state actors and cyber criminals. And last but not least, we talked about fileless malware attacks um, and the fact that they become the norm. Uh, everybody is doing fileless, PowerShell, WMI, other native tools that are um, uh, native to the operating system. And attackers are just um, using them instead of using traditional malware um, just because of uh, the strength of those attacks, the ability to um, not be discovered, and the fact that most security tools cannot detect them. But And last but not least, we had like a big aspiration for the year. We called it the year of the defender. We thought that there are good signs that 2018 is going to be better uh, in terms of cybersecurity. And we were optimistic. So we'll touch on this and whether this is right and are we going in the right way. So without further ado, let's go to the first thing that we thought is going to happen this year, which is supply chain attack. We thought they're going to increase and mostly remain underreported. Ross, I'm handing over to you. Why did we think that 
this trend is going to be growing? Yeah, so in 2017, we finally saw supply chain tax get reported in a way that we really hadn't seen before that, both in quantity and detail. And that was really the tip of the iceberg of what is going on. And I think 2018 is just going to continue that trend for a couple of different reasons. The first was as the large institutions, whether you're talking your defense contractors, your big banks, the Fortune 500 companies spend more money on cyber defenses, it's just easier to attack their ecosystem rather than going directly against the bulwarks that they've built. There's a lot of inherent trust and a lot of kind of side gates into the castles that these big Fortune 500 companies are building. And attackers mostly monetize their time when you actually look at the way in which the hacking ecosystem has been evolving over the years. And so they're going for the least amount of effort for the most amount of gain. And that usually involves a relatively simple hack against a weak corporation or a weak link in the overall chain to get up to the very high value target. And that's where the supply chain attacks really come into play. That's where you see a lot of the kind of dependencies that are built up in information technology and the business world in general being exploited to the level that they have been and why you're seeing more and more actors migrate this way going forward. Um, the other big thing is because of the scale of data that's already been released on the dark web that has already been bought and sold, prices for data and data leaks have been terribly depressed throughout 2017. You had monumental hacks such as Equifax and that sort of thing that released hundreds of millions of records. Healthcare has been riddled with data breaches, leaking PII and healthcare information for three or four years now as a major target. You're just seeing all of that data decrease in value. And so the people who are still playing in those markets have to find ways to either get much larger dumps to get back to the same monetization value or get into a new a business essentially. And so it just kind of pushes all these drivers for doing a single point where they can get to many different corporations and monetize their time in a better way than they had been in the past. And that's really the big trend that we were seeing in 2017 that made us feel like supply chain attacks are definitely going to be one of the things that we see more of in 2018. But because of the nature of the attack and because of the nature of how the hackers operate, we're not going to see a lot of good reporting on the supply chain hacks that do happen simply because it's really hard to trace back through third parties who the point of origin was. And that's one of the reasons why they're underreported and I think they're going to stay underreported. Awesome. And with that, guys, now that you heard why we thought this trend is going to be valid for the year, we're opening a poll uh, and we want you to rank us. Uh, do you really think this is a trend uh, from your experience in your organization with your security teams, with your customers? Uh, have you seen that this is a real thing? Please grade us and you'll say at the end what we think about ourselves. Um, we want it to be a little bit fun and interactive. So I see the poll results are coming and I'm going to share it with you at the end once we go over all the trends. So keep on voting. We'll give it a sec. Awesome. Good. Um, so, Ross, what did we see this year so far? Has this been a real trend? Uh, so, I, I think this is one of the ones that is being confirmed and will continue to be confirmed. Now, when we're looking at data for whether it's confirming a 2018 trend or was something that happened in the past, it gets a little dicey as to when information becomes available versus when the hack actually took place. Um, so like this example of the 247.ai, which was a, essentially artificial intelligent chat bot for Best Buy and Delta and Sears, it was the thing that was compromised that eventually led to credit cards being compromised. 
It actually took place in the tail end of 2017. It wasn't reported until 2018. So some of the dates get a little fuzzy, but we're definitely seeing more and more of this. And as the ecosystem of software as a service and that kind of stuff continues to explode, as there's more dependencies, you're seeing these people get taken down more and more frequently. And the compromises like this one, which ended up being credit cards, really had very little to do with their main service, which was the chatbot. But because of the trusted connections, the hackers were able to take advantage of the built-in the pathways and were able to compromise a lot of the information. Another really good example, and this one did actually take place in 2018, was the compromise of Securus Technologies, which was essentially a lawful intersight company that tracks people's cell phones for the police. Um, this was something that got kind of a blip in the news, but was really interesting from my perspective because the data that they accessed would allow criminals to figure out if they're being tracked by the police. And so it's almost as good as getting access to sealed warrants and that kind of stuff, because they can look themselves up and go, oh yeah, my local police department knows this number, this number, but not these three, I guess I should get rid of those phones. Um, and so it shows kind of the dependencies and the way in which we take for granted all of the kind of ecosystem the supply chain that we rely upon, but it makes us even more vulnerable than I think we really expect or are necessarily aware of. And it's something that we should all kind of take stock of and think about what inherent trust we're given to our third party providers, the people who are actually contributing to our product, whether it's through code or hardware, or the ones that we rely upon for services such as HR software or even chat programs. Um, GoToMeeting is technically a third party dependency that we're all currently using. Um, and it has the potential to be an infection vector because we're all logged into it. These types of things from a security professional standpoint is something we need to pay attention to. And the hackers have already caught onto this wave. Another big hit in 2018, and this kind of continues a trend of bad Chinese cell phones for the past couple of years, but they're still at it, is embedded malware in the actual hardware itself. And so they're shipping cell phones that already have malware preloaded from day one, the second you activate the phone, it's already there. Um, this type of stuff continues to happen and anybody who can infect that supply chain looking to monetize the individual, whether it's through banking information or their PIIs, looking for that angle. And the more global our supply chain is, the more opportunities they have to insert themselves, especially when you're talking to more unregulated countries and kind of the third world manufacturing that's being spun up where they have more access and more control from a cyber criminal group than you might have in some of the more Western and industrialized world. And with that trend, I think that the fact that we have less of control over the things that come in the supply chain is the thing that we need to worry about and work on. Um, that, and that's, as you said, it could be any software or any hardware that we're using and we need to be aware of it and aware of the level of control that we have over the uh, security, uh, the embedded security in those tools to begin with. Moving on, uh, our next trend was that destructive attack will be growing. Destructive attack in the format of wipers, ransomware that pretends to be ransomware but is actually uh, a destructive malware and all those kinds of attacks. We've seen some of this in um, 2017 and we thought that this is going to be an, a growing trend just because it's possible. Uh, Ross, what is your take of why is this trend growing? Uh, yeah. 2017 was another one of those cases where it really cemented a lot of the threads that were coming together. Um, at its core, the thing that encourages destructive attacks more than anything else is lack of consequences. Fundamentally, a destructive attack is different than espionage, cybercrime, anything that is merely the theft and transfer of information, the stuff that we have mostly been dealing with. 
the fact that you have nation states playing in this arena, and they've been doing it for a very long time, but doing so increasingly over the last decade, and there has been no real world consequences for it, really cemented home, especially in 2017 with NotPetya and a couple of the other big attacks, the Trissus attack in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's no consequences. And if there's no consequences for the big players, the cyber criminals are gonna start using this as well. And we really thought that 2017 was kind of the tipping point in terms of shifting from the realm of nation state actors messing around with technology and trying to use it in different ways of statecraft to cyber criminals using it for a couple reasons. Um, one is to cover up tracks because a destructive attack is the best anti-forensics capability that you could possibly lay down in a network. And then the other is to essentially sow chaos and discord. Um, you're gonna see a lot of cyber hacktivists picking up on this because DDoS has largely been neutered and this is the next evolution of that. And if nobody's really seeing increased consequences for any of this activity, as opposed to what they were doing before, it de decreases the likelihood of them getting caught. And it's something that is frankly relatively easy to do from a coding perspective. So they're going to keep on doing it and we're going to see it increasing. And that's really why we put it on the list because not only did we see it as a tipping point, but it's also probably the most concerning trend from my perspective on the defensive side of things is once this Pandora's box get opened, it's going to be very hard to put it back in place because once these tools proliferate and they already are, there's going to be no way to really pull them back. And I don't really see the international community responding the way that it did to say a ransomware threat or something along those lines. And I think that's going to be to our detriment in a couple of years. And with that, we're opening the poll again. Um, tell us what you think about this trend. Is it something that um, you've seen around? Um, what is your belief? As I said, we'll tell you at the end what we think, how well we predicted this trend. Okay, results are coming. That's great. Awesome. Um, tell us, Ross, about the destructive attack we've seen so far this year. Yeah, so of all the predictions in the research, this report, I'd say this is probably our strongest. Um, obviously, this year started with a bang or perhaps a whimper if you're going based off of results. The Russians attempted to do a destructive attack against the broadcast of the opening ceremony in Pyongyang. Um, and the attack fizzled for a couple of technical reasons and frankly a very good defensive effort from the game's organizers but it didn't take long to see kind of the first strike in 2018 from a destructive attack perspective and then we've seen several other iterations that fall in line of the other types of things that we've been talking about um you've got i almost want to call it cute um a uh, prank almost of destructive malware that deletes files called stone locker that if it infects your computer if you can't do the math between your current year and if i remember correctly the year stalin died in 1953 it will delete a file a minute until you enter in the right math um, it's stupid programming it's ridiculously simple but it's effective and it did actually cause some damage You've also got crypto miners that will put computers into an endless cycle of blue screens. So that way you can't actually remove them while they're harvesting your resources to mine cryptocurrencies. Um, there was also the patriotic attack against primarily Iranian routers that displayed an ASCII version of the American flag. It also hit, frankly, global routers. There were very few areas that weren't affected. And that disrupted internet connectivity across the globe for about 12 hours. Um, you've also seen a lot of targeted attacks using MDR wipers to clean up after themselves. This isn't necessarily a new trend. There was that recent report from ESET about the attacks in Latin America that the activity actually took place in 2016, but it was finally reported out earlier 
or late last month. Um, but I think the breadth of which that activity is taking place has greatly increased, and the boldness with which it's being used has greatly increased in 2018, just looking at our own data samples. Um, cyber criminals have realized they can do this and get away with it, and if they can execute an attack like that, it's very hard to trace them back to origin. And so they're being emboldened both by the lack of consequences and the decreased uh, chance of attribution. And this has really kind of up-leveled this entire threat vector dramatically. Definitely. Um, let's move to the next threat that we predicted. Um, so this is another trend that we've seen in the last few years. Um, APT uh, attacks that are more advanced, that are persistent, that are not one hit or miss. Uh, we've seen them, we call it going from uh, fine dining to fast food, basically commoditization. Um, anyone and everyone in um, the um, offensive side can nowadays perform those acts. Uh, while it used to be only a very small set of actors that were able to uh, execute this level of uh, um, uh, advanced attacks. Um, let's talk a little bit in details about why this trend was growing. Yeah, so really, to put it simply, the floor is rising and the ceiling is dropping. Um, the floor is rising for a couple of reasons. One is leak tools and exploits. Um, part of this is self-inflicted, part of this is through espionage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the fact that you have leak tools from pretty much at this point, every major nation state actor out there has had some part of their toolkit compromised and publicly disclosed. It allows cyber criminals all the way down to script kitties to have access to these capabilities. The fact that the entire eternal vulnerability suite is in Metasploit now essentially gives you the kind of scope of how easy it is. It's a point and click at this point to have what was an APT tool for a kid in high school who's just learning about network security and defense or a kid in high school who wants to get into hacking. Um, in addition to this, there's an immense transfer of knowledge going on, whether it's the freelancers that are hired by nation states that are also freelancing on the side, whether it's the guys who worked for the APT units and decided that they could make more money in the private sector doing their own thing, um, or it's the guys who are still in the APT unit that are doing things on their side. Um, but we're seeing a much greater transfer of knowledge between the different communities than we used to. And I think partly that's by design to obfuscate activity and to make it harder to do attribution, but it in general is just making the average cyber criminal more savvy, more capable. And frankly, the cybersecurity industry shoots ourselves in the foot a bit with this because whenever we find something really new clever and interesting we explain the technique in such great detail that other people then can replicate it and so the transfer of knowledge is happening kind of on both sides and everybody's just getting smarter about what cutting edge actually looks like on the ceiling is dropping side of things apts for the most part and there are some glaring exceptions have realized you don't have to be cutting edge to be successful and being cutting edge sticks out like a sore thumb when you finally do get discovered and it's not a matter of if but when when it comes to being discovered every major nation state that sponsors cybersecurity activity has been caught and attributed to some level everybody has been burned everybody's lost capabilities and resources and so the traditional mindset of I'll just engineer better and be sneakier and I'll evade detection forever has been shattered. And so they've mostly really forgone that mindset entirely and started grabbing lower rent tools and using those as capabilities. They've reverted back to more spear phishing. They've reverted back to a lot of more of the things that you associate with cyber criminals and even hacktivists 
as a way to blend in with the noise. So if they get caught in the early stages, it's really hard to say that it's a nation state rather than some cyber criminal. And if they get caught after the fact, there aren't any really distinct things from the malware perspective or the operational perspective that would tie them back to a nation state. And so by taking this least path of resistance, by trying to blend in with the noise that they're creating through the knowledge transfer on the other side by bringing the floor up, you're seeing this kind of large blending of everybody's doing approximately the same thing. Now, I did mention there were some outliers. There are some units that will still use very advanced things going against very special networks. But for the most part, I would put that as a category of threats that 98% of us don't actually have to worry about because they're going after very explicit technology and information that is well outside of what most people have to deal with. Well, you definitely convinced me. Uh, let's see what um, our participants think. Is this a real trend that has been going on? Um, give us your thoughts. And in the meantime, I wanna remind everyone that we'll be answering uh, your questions at the end of the session. So if you also have questions, feel free to type them in the little chat box um, on the go to webinar console. I hope that even though you scared people off that go to webinar may not be safe, people stay with us on using the software. <laughs> okay, so results are coming up. Um, and let's move on to an example that we've seen that showcased this exact trend. Ross, tell us about the honeypot operation that you've been handling. Yeah, so CyberReason threw together a honeypot as a fake financial services institution earlier this year. Um, essentially to see how attackers identify networks and what they do when they're inside of them. And we did a couple different technical things to make it harder and easier for people to compromise it. Um, and one of the things that we did was we set aside some boxes with relatively weak RDP passwords to see how bots had evolved. Because a lot of honeypots are low interaction they'll get popped, you can see the infrastructure that's scanning them, you can see the brute forcing, but you don't see what happens after the fact. And we really wanted to see if you gave them a complex network, what the next steps would be. And what we found was some of these guys had actually done a fair bit of coding and automation to really make their tools not only effective, but also efficient. Um, I will talk about this a bit more on the next grouping with Phylos as well, because there was a large Phylos section to this. But essentially what we found is at least one of the bots that popped our honey net was able to do recon, privilege escalation, and create its own user account at admin level so that way they could remote back in after their bot got discovered and those credentials were changed and attempt a lateral movement, which we ended up blocking all within roughly a minute or two. Um, and the speed at which they were doing this and the way in which they were doing this was incredibly effective and very well planned out. And the methods were very reminiscent of the automation that you saw with nation state attackers just a few years ago. Um, really, we hadn't seen this level of automation on the exploitation side of things from cyber criminals before. That's not to say that it didn't exist, but we haven't seen many good examples of it. This was really kind of more reminiscent of the APT scripting that we're more used to. And the fact that it dropped into what was obviously a bot, what was obviously looking for money and exploitation and cyber crime, it had all those telltale markings was honestly a little unnerving because as a defender, when the bot hit, there was very little that you would have been able to do to prevent it from executing its command. So you could have cleaned it up and it wasn't necessarily the quietest of things, but the speed at which it moved 
it already opened up enough holes that it would be a day or two process to plug them all back up. And depending on how quickly the human then intervened, you've already got an automated breach and uh, essentially Swiss cheese network just because of how quickly it was moving. Um, and there's been more reports um, that kind of back up this one. Although I will say there's been a surprising lack of reporting on APT activity altogether. And I'm not gonna take the absence of evidence as evidence of absence. Um, I'm just gonna say that this is still an open question for me personally. But the reporting that we haven't seen from an APT perspective has almost all been historical activity, which is a good indicator that nobody is really seeing the traditional telltale signs of true APT activity these days. Even when you're looking at like the DHS releases on North Korea, all of that data is from 2009, 2010. It's all very historical, it's all very old. Um, even the Protect Rise report that just came out on the Chinese activity, they kind of lumped everything together that was using one tool, was a historical look. It appears that the industry is at a loss for the new activity. So it's going back through its historical data and trying to pull it apart and make more fine-tuned attribution on the old things where there was plenty of data and plenty of indicators and they just didn't have the time to do the fine-grained analysis because there was so much data coming in and so much triage work that had to happen. Um, and then on the cybercrime perspective, in addition to the honeypot stuff that we've seen, you when you look at the evolution of banking trojans and the way they're doing command and control with SQL database commands rather than call-outs to websites with the anti-forensic capabilities that they're throwing into what used to be relatively simple and kind of throwaway pieces of malware. It just shows how much kind of the Git repository type mindset has infected not only programmers on the good side of things, but also on the cybercrime side of things and hacking in general. Everybody has reusable code, everybody is stitching things together, and you're seeing kind of these Frankenstein pieces of malware that have some really advanced capabilities and some really stupid ones. And it's because the code's just floating out there and people are stitching it together. And as you see more and more of these kind of amalgamations of weird code, it gets harder and harder to pull apart what was coded by somebody who was really good and elite what was coded by somebody who's just getting into the game and what was put in there as a potential false flag. And it's making attribution and understanding what APT is as opposed to everything else even harder. And I really don't see this ever reversing at this point. I think the age of tracking and understanding APT actors is more or less dead. We had our golden age from 2010 to 2014 or so. And now we're just going to be stuck in the mud trying to figure out how bad individual breaches are as opposed to being able to track campaigns. And with that, uh, it leads us to the next trend of fileless attack that's becoming the new norm. You already mentioned it, that uh, those existing tool sets make fileless file something that anyone could use. Um, why are they so common? Yeah, so I'll be the first to admit, of all predictions, this is by far the most obvious and least interesting from a conversational perspective, but it's a must-have on any prediction report for 2018. To leave this off would be a glaring omission just because it, it is a ubiquitous at this point. Um, uh, without getting my ahead of myself too much. The way it's exploded in 2018, um, it, it would be an egregious mistake not to talk about it, even though it's not really an interesting or alarming trend from the fact that we all saw this coming in 2017. I think pretty much everybody had this as the trend for 2018. This was what ransomware was in 2017. And it continues to grow, not because it's technically interesting or hard, but because it works. Despite the fact that everybody saw it coming, there are very few security products out there that are actually good at detecting and stopping this stuff. It's very easy 
to write a couple of file of scripts, throw them together and have an exploitation package and anything that's signature based, most of your Yara based type detections can be easily bypassed by most of your fileless malware and most of the scripting that they're doing. So while it should not be the bane of our existence, it's quickly becoming it just because it's living off the land and it's doing stuff that is abusing legitimate uses. And that is always harder to detect because it is more normal than the majority of what malware and traditional malicious activity is. And once you start getting into that gray space, it gets much harder to detect. And until the security industry catches up with these developments, I don't see this really going away. And I see it to continue to explode in 2018 because it'd be stupid for cyber criminals and hackers not to use this stuff. And until we force them off of this path, they're going to continue to do it. And it's going to continue to be effective. And frankly, as long as Microsoft continues to update PowerShell and makes it more useful and user-friendly for sysadmins, it's also going to do it for the hackers. So I think this is going to continue to be a world of hurt. Um, and I hope nobody on the line really disagrees with this one. And, and with that, I actually uh, wanna chime in with the question that somebody in the audience just asked. Um, will we see more use of fileless in new ways? Have we seen new trends in fileless lately? I think we are gonna touch upon it in a second, but anything that we've seen that is not the obvious things that we've seen before? So I think a lot of what we're seeing is repackaging of old tricks using new things. Um, so like the update Microsoft did to Excel that allows it to run code in the Excel spreadsheet now. That's obviously a fileless intrusion vector. Um, the reemergence of macros in Outlook and that kind of stuff was quickly seized upon by fileless malware to use it as the way to lay down things. Um, the way in which it's bundled, the way in which it's delivered is constantly changing, but at its core, it's going to be taking advantage of PowerShell scripting. Um, there are some really advanced techniques that are more associated with APT actors for memory residency and that kind of stuff that I haven't really seen anybody emulate yet. But I think, again, that goes back to what we said about the previous topic. Why engineer something that special and unique when all you need is three PowerShell codes and you can get root on a box? Um, or admin, sorry. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, fileless is a means to an end more so than anything else. And that means is to escalate privileges get an uh, admin account, whether it is one that's already resident on the machine or they're creating a separate one, and then lateral movement. If they can achieve all of those things without ever laying down a file, they're less likely to be caught by orders of magnitude. And the way in which they execute that chain is always going to change based off of what it, the in vogue intrusion vector is, what the network architecture is for what they're going after and what the security products are that are installed. Um, and really it's always going to be a horrid cocktail of a mix and match there. Definitely. And with that, let's open the poll for this prediction. Um, we heard several customers that were telling us stories about fileless attack. That's something that seems prevalent. I'm wondering if people um, on the call think indeed it's something that is very prevalent these days. Um, okay, answers are coming. And Ross, give us the example that we've seen lately. Yeah, so um, before I get to DNS Messenger, I'll uh, go back to the honeypot for a second, because I said that the speed at which it 
moved was the thing that was really startling to me. And that was because a lot of it was fileless. It was calling script after script after script after it got successful execution. And that is what made it so quick is that it was just running through commands and it didn't have to install anything. It didn't have to wait for a reboot. It didn't have to get a file permission change to drop something. It was just living off the land and moving quickly through the OS the way the OS was meant to be moved through. Um, and that level of automation combined with a bot is a little terrifying because the amount of computers you can harvest using that technique without a human intervention is astonishing. Um, and the fact that cyber criminals are moving to that just further reinforces how much we need to work on getting the entire industry up to speed on how to detect and prevent and hopefully stop execution of malicious PowerScript, malicious PowerShell, these types of things so that way we can actually move beyond this and force the hacking community to do something that's more difficult for them. Um, I think from our own statistics, and we pulled these about a month ago, so they might be a little off now, roughly 80% of the intrusions that we're detecting have some element of phyllis in them. Um, this is a big problem, and Cyber Reason is in one of the unique positions because of the way we architect ourselves. They were actually pretty good against phyllis. Nobody's perfect, nobody's fantastic, but I'd say we're head and shoulders above our competition on this. And we're seeing it in our own statistics. Um, we're getting a lot more phyllis attempts against our clients, and we're detecting and stopping a lot more of them and we're be able to do this year on year with same version numbers of software so it's not like we instrumented a new detection and suddenly we're catching a lot more it's just the stuff that we're able to detect has increased dramatically um, but dns messenger is another good example of this um, it's using a multi-stage tact it's using some very interesting technical techniques Again, it's a Microsoft Office product that allows the initial dropper, but it's, I think, three different file of scripts that eventually drops a backdoor. Um, but the way in which it executed was very targeted. It was used against only, I think, a handful or so corporations. And the basic thing to take away from this, because frankly, this method has already been burned, so we're probably not going to see it much in the future. But the fact that they're bundling three or four or five layers of fileless scripts together before you ever get to a piece of malware allows the hacker to do a lot of net reconnaissance on your network and on the machine, understand the environment they're working on, choose the flavor of malware they want to pull down and be far more tailored all in an automated way, which decreases the hacker's effort and time, which then increases their profit margin. And when you're dealing with cybercrime in particular, which most of us will be in the private sector, that's ultimately what it's all about. So every level of automation, every level of filelessness that they can use that gives them additional data before they waste a resource, they're going to take advantage of. And this is how they're going to use filelessness to their greatest advantage. It's all about the automation and the bundling capability and being able to fine tune what they're doing so that way they don't have as many misses as they used to. Um, and I think that's really the danger of Phyllis, and that's what we're seeing in 2018, is the use of Phyllis as custom tailoring, less so than the traditional blast spam email and the stuff that we're used to associating with banking Trojans or the exploit kits of rain everything down the same on the network, regardless of what it looks like and what type of value target it is. Thank you, Ross, for that. Um, and so far, we have been talking about threats and negative predictions, but 
we did have one optimistic wish for the year uh we were calling it the year of the defender we thought that for the first time in a long time uh things are slowly shifting and defenders are now capable of um, winning the battle uh we believe that this could become a thing uh, because we had good indicators that things are changing. Um, Ross, can you give a little bit of insight to why you believe that it's a possible trend? Uh, so I'll say this is a possible hope. Uh, I, I think when we were writing the report, there were a couple things working in the favor that really stuck out the we hadn't seen in a while. A couple things in terms of actually getting better on the defensive side of things. Um, you saw for the first time in a while reductions in time to detection and time to containment of intrusions. Um, they were small, but at least it's trending in the right direction. Um, overall, I would say the security industry is maturing and slowly getting better um and the big thing for me that made me hopeful was the attention that the board was finally paying to this issue um, i think not Pedia was the big thing that really drove this you had a lot of bad headlines in 2017 but not Pedia was probably the most costly um with a couple billion dollars worth of damages Boards suddenly had to take this threat seriously. It affected their bottom line. And I think when we were building this report, we all kind of had the consensus idea that 2018 was an opportunity for the security community to seize, for the CISO to move from the boogeyman portrayer to somebody who could help the business. And I think that's really what I still hope 2018 can be given all the discussion of GDPR and all the other things that have already happened this year, I think we have the chance to move beyond the doom and gloom purveyors to somebody who has the seat at the table that can actually empower security to be useful and proactive and get beyond the reactionary standpoint that we have been and reduce those times even further. And on that topic, you mentioned GDPR. I think we, we said that if one good thing that uh, probably came out of GDPR is that the fact that boards care now about privacy and security because it may cost them money. Uh, and, and we all know that GDPR, we still don't know whether um, uh, companies will get fined, but we know the potential of tremendous fines uh, for not complying with GDPR. So we, we looked at it as a positive thing that, okay, awareness is out there and we have an opportunity to build better, stronger, um, both compliance, but also uh, security measurements in, in uh, places. So we really think that there's still a chance. Um, I, I think that we've seen good moves. Um, somebody, it's funny because somebody just said um, in one of the questions that 2017 was a big year for ransomware and how come it's not on our list? I think we have a good answer for that, uh, which is really tied to uh, why we thought the year of the Defender is a good theme, right, Ross? Uh, yeah, so. Ransomware is down. Uh, it's a good news story. It's one of the rare ones right? that we have. Um, if you're looking at variants of ransomware, we're looking at about a 50% reduction from 2016 through the end of 2017, or sorry, from 2015 through the end of 2017. Um, in terms of deployment, efficacy, all of those numbers are trending downwards. And I, would say this is kind of one of the few good news stories from the cybersecurity industry where everybody kind of got together, realized that ransomware was one of those things that kind of transcended profits. And there was a common good to be had by working together on this issue. 
And we did a fairly good job with it, whether it was releasing utilities like CyReason did with Ransom Free or all of the decryptor software that came out of other companies like Kaspersky and ESET. Um, there was a lot of just security knowledge poured onto this topic and free tools released to either prevent infection to begin with or prevent payment on the back end, which drove a lot of people away from the market overall. Because again, at the end of the day, cyber criminals are about making money. And as you decrease profits, they're less likely to take out new endeavors because there are other ways to make money and they always go for the easier profit maximizing thing. Um, the other big thing in 2017 was ransomware was a big thing. So it got a lot of attention, but it got a lot of attention for, I'd say the wrong reasons insofar as both of the big things that were billed as ransomware, WannaCry and NotPedia, even if you paid the ransom, it didn't work. So it really reinforced the message that paying ransoms doesn't really get you your stuff back, so why would you pay it? Which further pushes people out of the marketplace of using ransomware as a business model. Um, now, there is a large exception to that, and that is the people who have decided to use ransomware as a targeted attack against specific institutions. Um, you see a relatively large uptick in going directly against municipalities, city governments, um, even state level institutions, networks that have sensitive data that isn't easy to replicate, but also does not have advanced cybersecurity knowledge or budgets. And so they're the ones that are most likely to pay. Um, and then the other large group there are the ones that run factory assembly lines have a lot of systems that are built into larger machinery that people don't generally associate with their networks. So things that are running old XP that nobody really thinks about because it's just my CNC machine. Um, those types of industries and companies are particularly vulnerable because a lot of those machines are networked, they hardly ever get updated, and so they're very ripe to be hacked and they're very ripe to be ransomed because they're very expensive. Right. So to summarize it, uh, I want to share with you um, guys uh, a report card and I want to share with you your own votes for us. Um, so for supply chain attacks that are increasing, we ranked ourselves as B, and I would say you kind of agreed with us. We got a B minus from you. Um, again, those attacks we think are underreported and underrepresented in the media, and we may have more than we know about it. In terms of destructive attacks, uh, we think that destructive is a trend that is going on. Um, you guys on the line gave us a B, uh, which is fine. Uh, we unfortunately think that we'll see more. Um, as uh, Ross said, uh, wipers are being used as a way to mask uh, other attacks. Um, and that's an easy way of getting out of attribution. And that's something we'll see increasing. Um, the lines blurring between APT actors and cyber criminals, we ranked ourselves as B. Uh, you ranked us as A minus, which is probably um, close. Um, basically, we haven't seen a lot of APT, new APTs being discovered. Uh, uh, and again, it could be because of uh, the attribution uh, problem. Uh, but we still think that this is something to remember. APTs will not go away. Um, there is so much to gain for those players and there's so many tools out there that it cannot go away, unfortunately. And in terms of fileless malware, I think we're all in agreement. Uh, this trend is still 
live and kicking and as long as we will not find good solutions to kick it out of our systems um and as long as people will use powershell because it's easy and effective uh, to get your it job done um, we'll see those things because they're so ubiquitous and last but not least um the year of the defender so we're positive as ross said ransomware is down and it's a good sign gdpr and the attacks of 2017 has made uh, top management in many companies care about cyber risk. There are cyber risk discussions everywhere. Everywhere we go, we hear CISOs telling us that they get seat at the table, something that wasn't a thing a year or two ago. Um, so we're positive about it. Uh, we have a lot of work to be done. And unfortunately, cybersecurity is where things evolve and we cannot stay complacent. So that's something that will always keep on rolling. With that, I want to invite you guys. I know that not everyone on the line is local in Boston where we are located, some are far away. And I wanted to offer you what I think is great opportunity to come to one of the most beautiful places in the fall. Um, so DEEP 2018 um, is, is the annual thought leadership conference of Cyber Reason. It will take care here in Boston on October 4th. Um, we like to think about it as anti-conference. People sit around, chat, talk, and uh, uh, in really interesting panels. Last year, um, we had really interesting talks. Go to our website and check it out. It's available over there. This year, we're going to have Gary Kasparov and Michael Lewis from the New York Times joining us. And we have another 12 amazing speakers lined up already. I want to give everyone on the call um, a special offer of $199. Uh, um, if you register by the end of June to attend, just go to uh, cyber.ly uh, slash dev2018 and enter year of the Defender uh, 2018. So YOTD 2018. You're going to receive an email. You don't need to uh, keep this in mind. Uh, no need for screenshot right now. We really wish to have you with us and have the conversation. Ross and myself are going to be there in person and would love to meet people coming in. Um, and with that, I I'm not sure that we have more time for questions. We will be happy. We had a lot of additional questions that we didn't answer throughout the webinar. We will be happy to email them to you with answers. Um, thanks for attending. I really hope we'll be able to see you this fall in Boston. And if not, come to one of our virtual webinars. Um, happy to see you soon again. Thanks, Ross, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.